Welcome back to the program. We're well, joining us now is Liberal MP Tim Wilson from our Melbourne studio. Tim, thanks for your time. I might just start on this. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it's great to see you push. all the way there in Canberra because I know that's how you introduced me at the end of the last segment, that I was all the way in Melbourne. I'm sorry, the national capital, that's the long way off. Oh, fair enough. We're in the bubble here. I'll cop that. Uh, yep. Seven hour drive either way anyway, so it does take a while. <laughs> I've done it a few times myself. Uh, I wanted to start on encoding. Um, you're on the sort of personal liberty side, small government when it comes to being a, a member of parliament. Where do you sit on this? Any reluctance about forcing tech companies to hand over this stuff or the way it's done? I think you mean encryption uh, rather than encoding. And uh, Sorry, the, the, yeah. short the, the short answer is uh, uh, I fundamentally don't have a problem with this. When we have issues around national security, people have met threshold tests justifying uh, surveillance. If they're sending encrypted messages between each other um, that may contain information that save people's lives or stop criminal behaviour, uh, I think uh, terrorist criminal behaviour, I think there's a compelling case. The challenge, as we know, is going to be making sure we work successfully with the companies uh, and make sure that we do it in a way where we get access to the information we need, um, but there have to be threshold tests met first and that's the path the government's heading down. I guess we'll see where it heads with George Brandis heading off for some meetings on that. Uh, Same-sex marriage, this private members bill push that Dean Smith's spoken about, do you, uh, do you know where this is heading at all at the moment? <laughs> this debate has been going on for more than a decade uh, with my involvement and every time I turn around there is another twist and turn. Do I have an answer about where it's heading? No. Uh, what I've read in the press is that Dean Smith uh, is going to put a bill forward for consideration, presumably to the party room. There'll be some sort of a discussion. My view on this issue is completely clear and ambiguous. My view has been that we should always resolve this issue in Parliament. I've said that a hundred times before uh, and that members of Parliament were elected uh, to support a plebiscite, which somebody like myself has done, uh, but we also have a free vote in this Parliament and so we'll end up where we will end up. On that very notion, the Nationals have mentioned the coalition deal in terms of not changing the policy on same-sex marriage. Do you think uh, that's going to be something that means this simply can't be gone past? Do you take that threat seriously from the Nationals? Well, I don't even know if it's in the coalition agreement because I've never seen a copy of it and I suspect most nationals haven't seen a copy of the coalition agreement uh, either. Uh, and so, um, in the end, the Liberal Party is a party where members of parliament are elected uh, with the freedom of a conscience vote. That includes myself, that includes Tony Abbott, that includes Malcolm Turnbull, that includes everybody else, uh, and that can't be traded away. Is that case strengthened as well? George Christensen of course crossed the floor as well on penalty rates. Is that the sort of thing that's discussed when you talk about the validity of crossing the floor? Well, I don't know what the rules frankly are of the National Party, so I don't have an answer to your question. All right, and just on this, I mean, if it's getting to the point where you really feel like people opposed to this will, will dig in and could try to blow up the whole leadership on it, at that point do you say, well, it's not worth doing that to this government, we'll keep our powder dry? Well, I think this is not an issue that defines the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party is a, 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 a political movement uh, organised for freedom of the individual and people free to live their lives as they see fit. It's a political party that believes in the value of family. Now, we uh, live in a modern society. We know that there are thousands of different family arrangements and it isn't the job of government to come in and dictate to people the terms of their relationships. It's to encourage them to enter strong, committed bonds, the foundation for family, community and country. And that's what we're going to be focusing on, I'm sure, and I hope uh, that's the approach my, my colleagues will take, because that's the approach I'm taking. And presumably at some stage this can be revisited. You've got a plebiscite policy in this period of government, but nothing yet determining what will happen in the next one. Uh, well, I've no doubt we're going to keep discussing this. My view is unambiguous uh, that I would like to move on from this issue. I'd like to frankly turn up to a Sky News interview and not have to answer a question on marriage for same-sex couples. I'd like the country to move on. I think the country would like us to move on. I think we'd like to go into an era where we focus on what's driving the budget problems uh, and particularly the, the deficit, how we're going to make sure we pay back debt and focus on how we're going to unite this country to face the challenges we, uh, we uh, confront in the 21st century. Well, just on that, your own party president says the party needs to be united and it's not at the moment and there should be a meeting between Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull. Do you think this will go ahead? 
Well, when I have advice for Malcolm Turnbull, Tony Abbott or Nick Griner, uh, I give it to them in private. Uh, and so I'm not going to go and do it through a television screen now. And I frankly have nothing more to say on it right now. All right. What about the prospects of Tony Abbott getting a cabinet position, though? Is it too late for that? Well, we know that uh, there's been mooted reshuffles uh, in the past, there'll be uh, ones in the future. I'm sure there'll be one in this term of Parliament. Uh, but that's a decision for the Prime Minister. Uh, he's made it quite clear that he wants to see generational change or new talent come through. Unsurprisingly, let's face it, as a Liberal MP who's part of a younger generation, I'm probably pretty enthusiastic about that, as many of my <laughs> colleagues are, um, uh, who are of a similar age group. Uh, but that's a decision for the Prime Minister. He's got to weight out state responsibilities, um, ensuring the party is united, uh, and also making sure that you have the talent because in the end a government is made up of people and people who come together because they have a common set of purpose and objective about doing what is in the best interest in the country and the skills and the capacity to achieve that. And if the Prime Minister assesses that Tony Abbott's part of that, then so be it. And if he assesses that any other colleague is part of that, then so be it. Sounds like uh, eager there and Ready and willing to serve, that comes up for you, Tim Wilson. Tony, if I can't uh, we'll be eager that. on a Monday morning, I don't know why I should even be in the job. Fair enough. Oh, I want to get onto this story today with John Roscombe from the Institute of Public Affairs. I know you were quoted in this, but he says that most Liberals don't believe in the science of climate change, most of the elected representatives, I should say. Uh, is that the sort of figure you think is out there, that most of your colleagues don't believe in it? Well, John Roscombe actually didn't say that. He said he thought around 50% of the party room were climate change sceptics. Now, Aaron Patrick actually contacted me uh, in, in interviewing this story, uh, and I made it clear that uh, being a climate change sceptic, if that's the term you want to use, can include people who uh, question uh, the catastrophic nature of climate change, uh, the policy implications, the economic implications. It can include a broad range of things. And so on one level, you'd have to say that the entire parliament, I would hope, would remain uh, questionable about some of the claims that have been made in the past. But do I think there's a majority of people uh, who are in the Liberal Party, the National Party, the Labor Party, the Greens Party, who question the fundamental physics uh, of anthropogenic climate change? No, I don't think that's the case. And this is where I think these questions, like the one put to me by Aaron Fitzpatrick about whether, of Aaron Patrick about whether I believe in climate change, only does a disservice to the community. And that's why my response was, belief structures are for religion. I look at evidence uh, and looking at the scientific basis of various claims. In terms of, though, OK, someone who's, I don't know how you want to term it, a hard sceptic or doesn't believe in the, the, the man-made contribution to climate change, is that much of a live discussion still with many of your colleagues? You don't, you're saying it's essentially not really up for discussion because most people are on board? No, no. The, the, if you want to talk about the human contribution towards um, a change in climate, people will openly have their differing views about the severity and the contribution uh, and uh, what policy responses are proportionate. That's called having mature adult conversation. And what we've had over the past uh, decade is people trying to shut down debate uh, on any discussion around both the science, the economics or the policy uh, around uh, climate change and renewable energy because uh, they have a view very strongly uh, that they want to decarbonise the economy. Are these issues up for continuous debate in the coalition party room? Yes. Uh, is that a fundamentally good thing? Yes. Uh, in fact, I'd hope that's exactly what the Australian public is doing because uh, we want to make sure that decisions are properly considered, debated before we implement things in law. I wanted to ask you as well about Julie Bishop's comment about Donald Trump. Of course, uh, Donald Trump, uh, to paraphrase him, but was well, giving a compliment, if you like, to Emmanuel Macron's wife, saying that she stays in great shape or something similar like that. Julie Bishop, of course, said that uh, it was an interesting comment. She wasn't sure that uh, Bridget Macron could say the same about Donald Trump. What did you make of that coming from the Foreign Minister? <laughs> well, we all know that the Foreign Minister keeps herself uh, very fit and in shape, and so I'm sure uh, she meant it as a reflection on uh, uh, enjoying the flattery that comes with that. Uh, you know, as myself, who, who probably should have gone to the gym this morning but didn't because I'm coming and beaming across the nation to you, Tom, uh, maybe she couldn't say that about me. Uh, do you think there's any sort of danger with this comment the next time that we need to talk to America at all? I, I don't think the Americans get upset about uh, uh, throwaway lines uh, about, you know, uh, conversations they have between foreign leaders. I actually think what the Americans focus on is firstly the strength and uni unity that we have with them as a country on values, but also in our current 
uh, common sense of purpose and interest uh, in the world as part of uh, countries who are interested in peace and stability and free and open markets and the promotion of democracy. That's what matters, uh, not uh, simple remarks by the foreign minister uh, on a television show. I guess certainly the uh, relationship survived the impersonation of Malcolm Turnbull, so you might be right there. We'll <laughs> it was see, a very uh, funny impersonation, otherwise. Tom. I don't. Know, I think I suspect you were there, but uh, it was a very funny impersonation. There was nothing to justify the really quite silly response from many people. I didn't mind it, but uh, anyway, a few of the commentary had other ideas. I want to get you quickly. What about broadly on Donald Trump and some of his woes over there? What do you make of it all? Uh, oh, I don't, I, I'm wary of talking about American politics in too much detail. Donald Trump clearly has a different style as a US president in comparison, say, Barack Obama or somebody else, but I think it's a reflection, or the reason Americans have turned to him is a reflection of their frustration with the system and what happens uh, when you have a democracy where the will of, or the, the, the people who are elected aren't able to implement their agenda. And we see a similar frustration in Australian politics, where we have a government that's been elected under the previous, uh, at the previous 2013 election and at the 2016 election. And we have a Senate who somehow think their job isn't to protect the interests of the states, which is their original purpose, or to review laws to make sure they're improved and they can be uh, implemented effectively, which has uh, traditionally been or the more contemporary interpretation of the role of the Senate. What you see is people who simply seek to obstruct. Now, this government is working very successfully with the Senate, despite that uh, obstruction sentiment, and getting more legislation through than has in the previous three years. That's a fundamentally good thing. But what we need to make sure is that that government is getting on with the job, achieving what people expect of it and being at their back and supporting the Australian public. And that doesn't come from people constantly trying to tear down political leaders simply because they have a difference of opinion or they want to find problems to try and remove them from office. All right, quite the pivot. We're running out of time. Tim Wilson, Liberal MP, we did speak same-sex marriage, but plenty of other topics as well. Thanks for your time today. <laughs> Thanks, Tom.